like Animax or something, <laughs> right? Bam. So welcome back. As you may or may not have noticed, there was some audio difficulty with that film. So I encourage you to go and check it out. Um, it's an incredible story. Um, in that eight-minute film, Pixar captured why companies still struggle with workplace diversity. Pearl premiered online on February 7, 2019, and was the first Pixar's Spark Short series, say that five times fast, which aims to highlight different storytellers and techniques. This short emphasizes the importance of workplace inclusivity and diversity as Pearl is ignored, shut down at meetings, and excluded from out-of-office bonding events simply because she's different. The film's writer and director, Kristen Lester, drew on her own experiences in the animation industry for Pearl's story. To check out Pearl again, or see other shorts, you can go to pixar.com forward slash spark shorts. And we hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did when we first saw it. I want to thank uh, everyone who came to the Fair Start Mixer. We had the TEA Western Division Mixer. Um, it was an incredible evening full of networking and a lot of learning about what Fair Start does. Uh, Fair Start is a real solution to some of our society's most pressing challenges, homelessness, joblessness, poverty, and hunger. Um, their model works because they are both effective social service provider and a thriving social enterprise. Fair Start helps people transform their lives create value for their community, and offer a way for everyone to play a role in doing something that matters. During the course of the evening last night, um, we learned a lot. We took some tours, and I want to thank uh, our sponsors for helping that occur. Uh, that's Hotop, Whitewater, Color Reflections, and Affiliated Engineers. Yeah, thank you, guys. One of the highlights of the evening was having Fair Start's director lead for the organization's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative, um, which has become part of the nonprofit's long-term strategic plan. And to tell you a little more about his role and what Fair Start does, I'd like to welcome to the stage Troy Coleman. Good morning. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you all. Had I known we would be meeting in my living room this morning, I would have brought snacks and margaritas. But you're stuck with me. To all those that were there last night, thank you. Welcome to my hometown. Welcome to Fair Start's hometown. You know, I was thinking uh, about this talk today, and I was thinking back on a conference I attended last spring in April down in San Antonio in which I met the executive director for the Fred Rogers Company. How cool is that? I mean, he follows in the legacy of Fred Rogers. I mean, that just blows my mind. And it got me to thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and my journey and my organization's journey. And I thought, if I'm going to talk on the subject, I have to share with you a little bit about who I am and how I've gotten here. And the top of mind piece that came was that I needed to give you an idea of who were some foundation influences. There are two. One is Fred Rogers. I mean, who doesn't love Fred Rogers from your childhood? And the other is my mom. I'll talk a little bit more about her in a moment. But Fred Rogers, early on in the television industry and in the media, really espoused the virtue of inclusivity and equity. And he used to end his show by being sure to identify that everybody is unique and special and makes each day special. And that's what diversity, equity, and inclusion is all about, is welcoming everybody to the table. That's what my journey has been all about my entire life. And I'm proud to say that my organization is recognizing that as well. Now, who am I? Well, Ian mentioned I'm Troy Coleman, Director of Annual Giving and Community Engagement for Fair Start. Yes, I am a fundraiser, but you're okay. I won't be giving the pitch today. Now, you may see before you, forming your opinions, many of you are thinking, well, this guy's tall. He's got a mohawk. Well, faux hawk, technically. Decent suit, bright colored shoes. Some of you are worried more about coffee. 
Some of you from the East Coast are probably really hungry for lunch. I always get placed before lunch. Uh, it's my thing. Listen to me and you can eat. But what you don't see is how I identify and who I really am. What you don't see is that I'm biracial. My mother's side of the family is Mexican. I don't identify as Caucasian. What you don't see is that I'm legally blind. Yes, I have glasses, but you don't necessarily know that. Beauty of that is you can see me, I can't see you. I also don't know where the edge of the stage is, so if I fall off, we'll just keep going. <laughs> I'm also gay. Some would say, duh. And I realized as I was writing this piece that I can add another element. I can add age. I'm 51 years old. Thank you. And I love being 51, I'll add. Why do I say all of that? Because my life is all about diversity, equity, inclusion. I have been in a different space my entire life. I have not been part of the mainstream. I would have no idea what to do there. And so it's driven a lot of who I am and the work that I do. And I mentioned my mom. My mom was a great influence. She was an amazing woman. Now, we fought like cat and dog, probably because we're so similar. But she saw people for their potential. She didn't see culture. She didn't see race. She didn't see gender for the most part. She saw you for who you were. And she saw potential in you. She was also a brailist. So she understood accessibility, which is also a big part of my world. She understood that for things to be equitable, people have to have access, whether they're blind or deaf, whether they have a physical disability or a mental disability. I mean, imagine following someone like that your whole life. It's not easy. But today, I so value it because it truly laid the groundwork for my journey. I remember early on, she had told me as I was applying for college, around 18 years old, finishing high school, it's like, you are just like a diversity committee's dream. <laughs> you're, you're half Mexican and you're legally blind. Now at 23, when I came out, she goes, why didn't you come out when you were 18? You would have been the trifecta. <sighs> My mother was not subtle, <laughs> but she was powerful. And she was influential, at least in the lives she touched. And she touched a lot of lives in this community. Now, later on, as my journey would begin into my professional life, I started to think about, what can I do with this energy of being different? And early on, before I even got into management, I realized what I could do was be a support to others. I could be a shoulder to cry on. I could be an open ear. I could support those who are experiencing what I've experienced. I could simply be present. If I, if, if I ask of you one thing today, I ask you to be present. Because diversity equity work requires us to be present in the here and now. It requires us to be open. That was the other thing I learned early on in my career. I needed to be open to everyone. And I took that very seriously because when I got into management, as managers, we get a little jaded, we get a little myopic in our view. And I needed to remember that there are different there are folks that are at different places on the life's journey, and we need to be open to that, and we need to make sure that we're welcoming the right people in. Just because they may have the qualifications on paper, there may be things that we're missing. Inclusion requires us to welcome everybody. And we really should, because we're all human beings. And I took that very seriously, and then as I got into management, I started really getting into more organizational structure. I started to recognize that what I could be was an advocate at the highest level to my leadership, to my board. I could start to really help shape what things would look like culturally within my organization. That was really powerful. It was also really terrifying. 
But I also realized something else. And this is a very important piece of this type of work. It is being open to fucking up. We're gonna make mistakes. Anybody who tells you they haven't screwed up is a liar. Because we do. There's been articles recently, um, I've seen several on LinkedIn, for example, um, of CEOs who are talking about, quote unquote, DEI work, diversity, equity, inclusion work, accessibility work as well. And the common thread I've seen is they talk about their fear of the work. They don't want to screw up. They don't want to make mistakes and hurt people along the way who have helped build their companies. There's a lot of ego in there. What they recognize though, the ones that are most powerful, is that they are open to change and they are open to those mistakes and they are open to hearing about what they've done and being sensitive to it enough that they then say, not only can I change myself, but can I change my organization? Can I change how we do things so we are open to everybody? That's a really powerful piece right there. And it's really important for us to understand, especially for those of us who create environments, which I know many of you do, where you're engaging a broad spectrum of people, being open to how those environments influence people, how people can receive them, how people can enter them, how people exit them. What I love to know is that people are open I don't want to say criticism, I will say critique. They're also open to hearing how they can make it better so that more people can be part of it. This isn't just about being part of the discussion. It's being welcome to the table to be at the discussion. It's about having access to the discussion. It's about your voice being heard. Now, I was asked to talk about Fair Start in our journey. This is an organization, many of you were there last night, so you probably heard a little bit about my passion. For those that weren't there last night, Fair Start is an organization founded as a nonprofit 28 years ago that provides a pathway for those living in poverty and homelessness to rise above their barriers and jumpstart their life. To discover who they are. We do that through food service industry training, restaurant training, and catering, restaurants, cafes. We have a contract meals program that's helped support over 850,000 meals to the community of Seattle for those who would not otherwise have a hot meal. All of our students start in that program, learning basic skills. But we not only teach knife skills, we teach life skills. We give the students the tools for their career, but we also give them the tools they need for life. A lot of our students have been incarcerated. A lot of our students have been living on the streets for years. A lot of them have many obstacles and barriers that they need to work through, and we give them that opportunity to work those through. And that way, when they walk out, we don't transform their life. We give them the tools to discover their power within. We also have a youth, two youth programs that work with 16 to 21 year olds. Our goal with that program is so that they don't have to get into the adult program. They, that we can catch them early. They can graduate high school with a high school diploma and go on to successful careers and lives. We have an apprentice program for those who already have experience in the industry, trying to level up the next step in their career. This program started two years ago. We're the only food service industry apprenticeship program in the United States. Now, all of that's happening. We also have a national program, which I didn't mention last night, called Catalyst Kitchens. And Catalyst Kitchens helps organizations scale or incubate across the country. We also have 78 members of Catalyst Kitchens by Fair Start. And those members are a cohort to help support each other. They use the Fair Start model, but then they are 
champions within their community. We can't be all things to all people, but what we can do is provide the resources and tools for them to be successful, so we have this Catalyst Kitchens program. Now, how does that relate to everything I'm talking about? We started to recognize as an organization that certain populations we were working with were not graduating at the same, same rate. We started to recognize we needed to change how we scheduled training so that single mothers who have children could work with childcare. I mean, anyone that's a parent in this room knows how difficult it is to manage your life. Now imagine being homeless in training and having to juggle all that. That's, that's really demanding. So we had to be open to that. We had to be open to our staff changes, realizing that we have members of our staff who are trans and we're using completely the wrong pronouns. The restaurant business isn't exactly the most uh, liberal environment, so there's a lot of work to be done. What we recognized is we want to be a space that is diverse and inclusive and equitable and accessible, but we weren't necessarily doing a good job of it. We could say the words, but there were folks like me flagging, like, hey, I'm the loud mouth over here going, guys, you, we need to look at this. And our staff and our students and our donors and our volunteers started to step on step and help us recognize where we needed to affect change and make change. So a group led by myself and a couple other directors sought a consultant. But we didn't want someone who was just going to come in and teach a class. I mean, we've all been in those four-hour classes where they teach you how to be a good person at work. <sighs> you know as well as I do that doesn't work. You have to change culture. You have to make a shift, and it has to be intentional. So we looked for a consulting team to do just that. Assess our challenges. Assess our successes. Help us evaluate who our student body is. Help us evaluate who our staff, who all of our stakeholders are. Help us develop coalitions and networks within the organization so that the work that needs to be done can be done and done by people who are passionate and want to do it. We didn't want to voluntold anybody. We've all been there. And that was very intentional. We are a year into that work. On average, most organizations take five to seven years to really go through it and start to see the effects of change. But I can tell you, just behind the intentionality of doing it, just behind committing this, by setting up work groups to work on specific aspects of the project, by focusing on such small items even as pronouns, I've seen a change. I've seen people welcome to the table who were silent before. I've seen people step up who would not otherwise do that. Both students as well as staff and volunteers. And we want to be an environment that welcomes everybody. I often say Thursday night we have guest chef night. And Thursday night is also graduation for that, that week's cohort. And at graduation, I, which I host at least 10 times a year, I use the line that you often hear in church, but I think it applies to everything. Wherever you are, whomever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. You are welcome at our table. We are all about food. We want everyone to join us and partake in that meal. But more importantly, we want them to be part of the Fair Start community. We want them to be part of this work that we're doing. Diversity, equity, inclusion is all about that. If you should walk away with nothing from this week, which I know you'll walk away with a lot because there's amazing speakers over the next two days, I would like to challenge you to look at your own lives on a personal professional and organizational level and ask, where can I make change? You may be already involved and in it. How can you step it up? You've already committed to being at this conference. That's a big step. For those that are brand new to the journey and a little bit fearful of it, start small. 
read about the subject matter. Heck, go back and watch Mr. Rogers. Troy, thank you so much. Thank you that so was much. Excellent. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much.